What's the story of Morning Glory? What's the word, Hummingbird? Thank you so much for clicking on my channel and for joining me for this review of Married at First Sight, Season 17, Episode 17, Crash and Bond. So we start off this episode with Emily and Brendan at the hospital. We all know what happened last week that um, Emily had crashed into a tree on her ATV and her injury was really bad. When we saw her this episode, it was a lot worse than what I thought it was. Um, luckily, she doesn't have a concussion, but she will definitely definitely need stitches and they say that Brennan told us that the tree branch went under hel her helmet and that is what caused that really really intense scar that started from her forehead and went all the way up to her scalp um her hair was completely covered and matted in blood this girl just has the worst luck with her hair on the show uh first it was very matted up um when they went on their honeymoon to cancun um her hair got extremely matted up they had to get a professional to come and try to you know detangle it and now she got into this horrible injury and her hair got really tangled up in the blood her hair was like completely covered in blood it was that bad it was a horrible horrible accident Thank God it wasn't any worse because it looked like it could have been a whole lot worse. Brandon calls the rest of the cast who are back at the at the resort house or at the retreat. I'm sorry, at the retreat house. And basically all he can talk to is Claire, Lauren and Austin because Becca is in bed sick. And Cameron, he's dealing with whatever he's dealing with, with his own medical condition. And so all we have is Claire, Lauren and Austin. Michael and Chloe have not arrived yet. So... He explains to them what happened. Of course, everybody was shocked and they did get a chance to talk to Emily. So she was well enough to talk to them on the phone. And um, thank God, all we can say is thank God that, you know, she survived this and it wasn't worse than what it was. Moving on from there, Chloe and Michael. So Chloe and Michael are getting ready for their trip to the retreat. And as they're packing up, Michael is wearing his skirt and, uh, it's, this is still very off-putting for Chloe. She's still not accustomed to seeing a man wearing a skirt. Now, what I will say is this, you know, to me, the way he, okay, him wearing the, the skirt and all, it does, it's, to me, it's not a big deal. Um, it's not a big deal to me. I understand why a lot of other women might find it very disconcerting, but the way he was wearing the skirt, it didn't like shock me. When you understand his personality and you know how he is, it, it doesn't shock me that he was wearing the skirt. I, it wasn't like he was wearing some dainty little, you know, floral print type of skirt with pleats. It, it was just, to me, it really reminded me of like a Scottish kilt. I understand that a Scottish kilt has its own very specific meaning to the Scottish, Scottish culture, but it reminded me of that. You know, when you see a man wearing a Scottish kilt, you're not thinking, oh my God, what is he doing? What is he wearing? What is that? Why does he want to look like a woman? You don't think that. And so when I saw Michael with his skirt, I wasn't like blown away. It didn't shock my, you know, like shock my nervous system to see him wearing this skirt. It was sort of, dare I say, like a masculine type of skirt. You know what I'm saying? If you can, if there's such a thing, I know that sounds like an oxymoron. It was sort of like it had, a, it was a masculine color. It was a muted color. It wasn't pink. It wasn't fuchsia. It wasn't some type of floral design. It looked like it was really thick material. And plus he had on like black leggings or black uh, sweatpants on underneath. And so, and we've seen like, like, you know, musicians and celebrities and rock stars kind of dress kind of like this, you know, where it just really fits his personality. That's all I can say. It just, it fits his personality. I kind of understand who Michael is. I kind of get him. So to me, it wasn't a shock, but your girl Chloe wasn't having it. So Becca and Austin, Becca has the stomach flu. And so she's been laying up in bed and Austin says, you know, this really sucks because he wanted to put more effort into their physical connection. 
Here we go again with Austin talking about how he really wants them to work on their intimacy and he's really hoping that things work out for them physically. He says all of this stuff, but delivers absolutely nothing. And I think this is what frustrates Becca more than anything is that he'll build her up or he'll build up this expectation of how he's going to do better and it's going to work out and they're going to be doing this and hanging off, off the chandeliers. And it's going to be this really one magical, wonderful night. And then when it, when the time comes to deliver, your boy is nowhere to be found. And so he uses, um, her illness, like, oh, shucks, you know, we really can't do anything because, you know, Becca is sick, but Austin, when she wasn't sick, y'all still weren't doing anything. <laughs> okay. So stop blaming your parents' cats or your grandparents' cats, you know, stop blaming her stomach flu. Cause when these things are not there when she's healthy and there are no cats around she's still like disappointed in you so the fact that she has a stomach flu means absolutely nothing and he further he goes on to say further I just hope that we can grow our physical int intimacy when she gets better okay we're gonna hold you to that moving on back at the hospital Emily and Brandon share a very you know touching moment I guess you could say uh, she's laying in her hospital bed with you know all the blood in her hair and he's sitting next to her and they're holding hands and so it's like you know they're sharing this moment they're bonding over this tragedy uh, he says that the wound is so bad that she's going to have to get plastic surgery that's what Brennan tells us Brennan talks about how they overcame this tragedy together and how this really united them and um this shows that they're really meant to be in each other's lives I'm not trying to downplay that if that's how he feels wonderful but you, I mean I don't understand like what else were you supposed to do you are supposed to be there for her if nothing else she's your co-worker <laughs> you know she's your close co-worker the one that you live with so when she um, went through this, obviously you need to be there for her. And, you know, like, I don't understand why he makes it, he made it such a big deal. Like, oh, you know, we really made it through. And, uh, this just shows, you know, I don't, I don't know what it shows, Brennan, you were doing what you were supposed to do. You don't deserve a kudos for that or a cookie for that. You were doing what you were supposed to do as a fellow human being by being her side, being by her side and being the one that's closest to her because y'all live together. Yes, you're doing exactly what you were supposed to do. Moving on from there, Michael and Chloe, they finally arrive at the retreat. And of course, they can only meet three people, Lauren, Austin, and Claire, because like I said, Becca's on the sick and shut-in list. Emily and Brendan are still at the hospital. So at dinner, the only couple that is still together, because they all are having dinner, right? They're having dinner made by a private chef. The only couple at the dinner table that is, is I guess you could say that it's still together or that is together is the newest couple, which is Michael and Chloe. We have Orion and Lauren who are divorced. We have Claire by herself. We have, um, who else was there? I think that was it. <laughs> that was it, y'all. So Michael asks everybody, you know, how their journey has gone so far. And of course, Orion will always take the opportunity to talk about him and Lauren. So he starts talking about how their marriage only lasted for 10 days. He talks about how it fell apart soon after the honeymoon, but it really fell apart at the honeymoon. I don't know what he's talking about. It really fell apart at the honeymoon. And he said that there, there was like a lot of tension between them, but he's hoping to find a common ground with Lauren. And then after he was done with his little soliloquy, it was like dead silence because he was expecting Lauren to chime in and nobody was talking. And so, um, Orion was like, um, Lauren, would you like to respond? And Lauren was like, I'm just here enjoying my damn wine. What do you want her to say, Orion? She doesn't want to, like, what do you want her to say? You're the one that takes every opportunity to talk about, you know, what happened between you and Lauren. She doesn't want to talk about it. You know, she's trying to move on. She's trying to move past this. You're the one that keeps on bringing up how, yeah, I didn't work out, but I'm still hoping that we can build this bridge. This bridge that you keep talking about, Orion, will never get built. Just forget about it. You're going to have to swim across that river. You're not walking across no damn bridge. She's not interested in building building a damn bridge with you let it go and leave her the hell alone and I felt like if she didn't want to say anything she didn't have to say anything Lauren tells us that 
you know, she's talking directly to us now. She tells us that Orion is just, you know, putting on for the public, but he makes no effort when there isn't an audience for him to perform to. Because every time he talks about how he wants to reconnect with Lauren and how he wants to build this bridge with her, build this friendship with her, he's only talking about this when there's other people there to, to hear it. He'll never reach out to her in private or when there's no camera crew there. Um, so he's trying really hard. Like whenever there's an audience, Orion is trying really hard to make it look like, you know, he was not the villain in their marriage. He wasn't the cause of their breakup, you know, because look at him now, he's really trying to reach out to her and still trying to keep up a friendship with her. But I don't know who's falling for it. Thank God Lauren isn't. So moving on from there, it's game night. So after dinner, they play this ridiculous game and it's just a game about, um, you know, people write, like you write down something really strange or crazy or interesting about yourself. You put it in a big old jar and then people will pull it out and read it and try to guess who it is. So, <laughs> One of the things that was written was someone had written that they had open mouth kissed a donkey and it happened to be Austin, y'all. He had open mouth kissed a donkey. I'm pretty sure alcohol was involved, but nonetheless, he had open kissed a donkey at one point in his life. And when you think about that and how he's struggling with Becca, y'all, the jokes write themselves. I, I'm not even going to bore you with that moving on to Lauren and Orion so while people while the rest of the crew is having game night Lauren and Orion are down in the basement well Lauren is down in the basement and she's just trying to have a moment to herself but I guess Orion found out there was a camera crew with her so he rushed down there and he was like can I steal your ear for a moment so he says that he's really missing their connection the BS that the men on this season speak, they're all so full of it. From Brennan to Austin to Orion, they are so full of it. That's why Michael is kind of like my favorite, but maybe because we don't really know him that well yet. But he's kind of like my favorite guy for this season because to me, he's pretty damn transparent. He might talk a lot, you know, he doesn't know when to shut up. But to me, other than that, he's pretty transparent. It doesn't seem like he's running game on Chloe, like the way these other men are running game on their wives. And so Orion says that he's really missing their connection. Um, he wants them to be this. Oh, cause so whenever at dinner, when he talked about, you know, what happened to him and Lorna, when he was explaining to Chloe and Michael, what happened to their journey and why it ended so early, he expected Lauren to pitch in and to expound more on what he was saying but she didn't she was like I'm just gonna sit here and enjoy my wine so in the basement he basically lets her know that he had wanted them to put up more of a united front at dinner and I guess he had wanted her to say more about their journey and Lauren was like why would I try to put up a united front with you post divorce when you didn't want to put up a united front with me while we were still married and I was like come on Lauren come on with the logic so and it just made me reminisce on how during their marriage, he really left her out to dry. He uh, threw her under the bus. He made her look like she was some kind of raging racist. He made her look like she was unhinged and out of control and couldn't control her emotions. It was horrible. The kind of picture that he was trying to paint of his own damn wife. So um, she was like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to put up a fake front with you when you didn't want to stand by my side during our marriage. So Lauren says that he doesn't, oh, he, she tells him straight up. She tells him he doesn't try to build these bridges in private but only wants to play the good guy in front of other people so she completely called him out on his bs on how you know you only want to reach out to me when there's other people around but when there's nobody around i don't hear from you i don't hear hide or tell from you so stop the games. Orion talks about how he still wants to try to build some type of friendship with her. Orion, leave this woman alone. You wanted a divorce. You got your divorce. Now leave her the hell alone. Go move on. Go do something else. Go play with somebody else. But leave our girl Lauren alone because Lauren is trying really hard to move on and to move past this whole entire fiasco of a marriage. Because every time Orion starts, you know, talking to her and bringing up the past, she gets emotional. She starts breaking down just leave our girl alone 
moving on Emily and Brennan so they finally return from the hospital and everybody is shocked to see how bad her injury actually was because it was pretty bad uh, when she comes back to the to the retreat part of her head is like shaved right because they had to shave her head to do her stitches and she has got she has this huge scar on her forehead like like I said from from like from her forehead all the way to her scalp um, her eye is also uh, really uh, swollen one of her eyes is also pretty swollen so Lauren noted how um, Emily is still able to put up this really sunny disposition because she was laughing with them. She was joking with them. And, you know, she was um, being her normal Emily self. Did I call her Lauren? I meant Emily. Emily is still being her normal Emily self. And so Lauren pointed that out. And I was wondering if Brandon took note of that, because remember Brandon um, at one point during their marriage, I think when they had gone out to dinner, just the two of them, he, he had told Emily that she was a negative person and it was shocking to hear him say that because she is the most positive person on this show where he's always down in the dumps he's always negative Nancy and I was really upset that he said that to her so even during this horrible tragedy where she's like physically in pain and almost you know was like an, it, with an inch of losing her life probably or having some type of horrible brain injury because remember Sonny Bono shares ex-husband he was skiing in the mountains and he ran into a tree and he died so luckily she had on a helmet and you know it wasn't worse for her but through all of that she's still able to joke around with these people and you know put up this really positive attitude and I really need Brendan to just to see that so Becca she's still you know in, in the bed sick and um she says that Austin slept in another room of course he did because he doesn't want to catch whatever you have he better have slept in another this is like the only time that we approve of Austin <laughs> sleeping in another room because we don't want him catching her germs and you know spreading it around to everybody else so the next day the guys are playing cards and the women are having, they're doing like a, they're doing like a facial day, they're having facials, right? So Chloe tells the girls that Michael's feminine flair is making it a challenge for her to feel any kind of attraction for him. I don't know what else he's wearing, but from what I have seen, okay, it, it didn't blow my mind. It didn't shock me. Like I said, in the beginning, um, it, it's not like he's putting on blouses and, and slacks and skirts and wearing high heels and wearing makeup. And if he was doing that, that's his prerogative. There's nothing wrong with that, but I understand why she's, you know, like, that's like, you know, it's, it's putting her off. I get it, but girl, it, it could, it could have been a whole lot worse. Right. So yes, he was wearing the skirt, but he wasn't wearing it with, you know, pumps and carrying a clutch. It was just a skirt. Okay. He's trying to like, you know, break down these gender barriers. You know, if, if women can wear pants, why can't a, a man put on a skirt? That's like, you know, somewhat masculine looking. But anyways, I know I'm cut from a different cloth. I know a lot of people are not going to agree with me. Um, people are going to come out and say, oh, but he's probably secretly gay or he's a crossdresser. I don't see that in Michael at all. Um, not, I don't see that in Michael. Um, I think he just has a certain style. He's just one of those people that's got like a very extreme sense of style. So she tells the girls how it's really challenging for her. Um, down in the basement, wherever the guys are playing cards, Orion asks Brandon the question of the hour. <laughs> he asks Brandon, well, um, now that you have gone through this, you know, really traumatic event, are you still going to friend zone Emily? And... Um, <laughs> Brandon gives his typical non-answer where he says a whole bunch of words like he says like a lot of stuff but really says nothing at all so he says something about he was going to give they're going to give it their best shot and I don't know what else he said it was just a bunch of nonsense he didn't really give an answer we know what we need to know Brandon from you yes or no are you still friend zoning Emily after you know she damn near lost her life are you going to friend zone her or is this going to rekindle the spark or not even rekindle but kindle it I guess is it going to bring about some type of chemistry or spark between y'all do you see her in a different light do you feel like now that you kind of play like her hero and you're by her side the whole entire time is this gonna you know turn on some feelings in you for her that's what we want to know and just tell us yes or no Moving on, Emily tells the girls, you know, she basically praises Brennan. Um, she really paints him out to be a lot bigger than what he was, more of a hero than what he was. I mean, she acts like this man, like picked her up from the ATV and carried her all the way to the hospital or something. Um, 
so she was like, oh, he was always, he was there by my side. And then she starts crying, you know, cause she's just so overcome with emotion, um, because of the fact that Brennan, you know, was there by her side moving on from there. So later on they have yoga. So after they do the yoga exercises, the yoga instructor asks the group, um, how do you show compassion in your marriage? And so Brennan speaks first, or they edit it to make it look like he spoke first. And he looks at Emily who's sitting off by this on the side because she didn't really participate. Um, um, he looks at Emily and he tells her that he shows compassion. He shows, he shows compassion, uh, by showing empathy and just really being there for her, et cetera, et cetera. And even though she was wearing her sunglasses, I can tell she was looking at him with such pride and she was probably looking at him like, looking at him like, Oh, that's my man. That's my man. Okay. We'll see how it all turns out at the end. So Becca starts feeling better and she's having a conversation with Austin and she tells, she makes it known. She wants everybody to know that the reason why Austin did not sleep in the same room with her while she was sick was because she kicked him out. Okay. He didn't voluntarily leave. He couldn't leave her side, but she had to kick him out. And so Austin, he starts making promises about working on their intimacy once again. Once again, we have Austin in the daytime making all these promises of what's to come at night. And then when the sun goes down, your boy is M.I.A. Moving on. Lauren and Orion. So they're having a conversation and Lauren tells Orion, I don't know what he asked her, but she answers him by saying, well, I'm open to being open. Kind of like, okay, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll have a conversation with you, whatever. So she says that she's willing to be civil with him, I guess. Um, but she doesn't want to go any further than that. She really doesn't see a friendship in the future. She says she only wants to surround herself like with really genuine people. And that's basically her telling him, you know, I think you're fake. I think you're phony. I think you're disingenuous. I don't want you anywhere near me, um, you know, messing up my spirit. So Lauren says that his efforts right now are too little too late. She says, if this was, what did she say? Six weeks ago, three weeks ago, I don't know what time frame she used, but if this was a few weeks back, him making this effort would have meant a lot to her. Well, because I guess they weren't filming three weeks back. He wasn't going to try. But now that they are filming together again, now he's going to put on this show. So she tells him, you know, if this was like, you know, a few weeks ago, um, your efforts would have meant more to me than they do now. But basically, you know, too little too late. So then he asks her, well, is it OK if I check on you sometime? And she's like, uh, let me reach out to you. Don't reach out to me. I'll reach out to you whenever I'm ready. So then it's time for Ninja Nation. So everybody, everybody, all of them go to this place called Ninja Nation, which is like um, an obstacle course type of place, like a playground or inside playground for adults where you can do rock climbing and all kinds of activities. So um, <laughs> all I can say about Ninja Nation is that your boy Michael put all the non-skirt wearing men to shame. OK, the obstacles that no other man could compete, Michael crushed them because his upper body strength is just impeccable. So as he's doing these challenges and he's hosting himself up on these walls and swinging from these um, bars and whatever, doing, I mean, just crushing the challenges. Um, your girl, Chloe, is like, mm, OK, I see you. And um Claire was even like girl that's your man's that's your man's because he was really do he really did a good job so after they do all the obstacles and the challenges they all sit together as a group and um Austin once again Austin brings up how he needs to up his romance game leading her on, giving her all of these expectations that he's not going to deliver. And it's like, okay, if you're gonna talk about it, Austin, we're still waiting for you to be about it because you're doing a lot of yap, 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 yap and absolutely no action. And if you know you're not gonna fulfill what you're saying, just stop saying it. You know, like I said before, your friend, friend zone her, tell her I'm not interested, tell her I'm not attracted to you, tell her I'm not your type, tell her whatever you got to tell her, but stop telling her lies and stop leading her on. So now it's time for this bath scene between Chloe and Michael, because, <laughs> you know, even though he crushed that challenge, he still has, you know, damn near 40 year old bones. So he had to soak in the tub after his challenge. So Michael is in the tub soaking and, um, Chloe comes into the bathroom and, she sits on the on the edge of the bathtub and 
Um, but at the same time, she's checking him out and she talks about how, you know, that both of them are having a conversation about like, what do they think about the fact that a lot of these couples, their journey seems like it's, you know, done. And they both pride themselves in the fact that they're really good communicators. All of these people were good communicators at one point and look where they're at now. So it's not about even the communication. It's just about the chemistry. Is there chemistry between y'all or not? So she didn't mind. So as they're talking, of course, like I said, you know, she was checking out his um, chesticles because, you know, he's a pretty muscular guy. So moving on from there, Becca and Austin, they're having a conversation again because they do a lot. They do. If, there, if nothing else, Becca and Austin do a whole lot of talking. Somebody get them a podcast, a talk show or something, because these people, they do a lot of talking and not much else. So they're sitting on the couch and they're having this conversation again about their lack of intimacy. Becca calls him out on how he talks a lot about working on int intimacy, but does nothing about it when it comes time, you know, to actually show that he's working on intimacy. And I understand that she's probably even talking about actual like sex or intercourse she's just talking about something beyond making out like y'all are you know in high school so he apologizes for not living up to her expectations um she starts crying she gets really emotional um she says that she keeps waiting because there's this big buildup because he, he's constantly telling her, oh, I'm going to do this and we're going to do that. He's constantly telling her he's going to work on it. And, you know, he really wants it to work out between them in that area of their relationship. So he's building up this huge expectation, but then he gives her nothing. And she tells him that she's, you know, she keeps waiting and how it doesn't feel good to beg to be wanted. Now, one thing I can say about Becca, she's bold. She is bold because a lot of women would never ever show or admit or tell a man that they want them sexually if the man is clearly not showing any kind of sexual interest in them like a lot of women just would not go there it's like a lot of women would rather wait for the man to make the first move and if he doesn't make the first move oh well you know too bad so sad but becca is like laying her heart out on the table she's being so transparent she's like exposing like the most um like the most the most sensitive part of her and she's brave. <laughs> That's all I can say. Now, if I was her good girlfriend, I would tell Becca, girl, don't you dare. Don't you. Okay. You've already let him know what you want. Leave it at that. Don't you ever bring it up again. If he's not making the moves, he ain't making the moves, girl. You need to move on. Just don't ever make it look like you're begging him to want you. You're begging him to sleep with you. That's what I would tell her if I was her good girlfriend. And Becca, why aren't you having any FaceTime conversations with any females in your family? Um, any friend, like what is going on? Everybody else is FaceTiming their friends and their relatives except for you Becca you need to talk to your girlfriends so she tells him that she just wants him to want her and he was like I do I thought you believed me and Becca says I do want to believe you which clearly tells us that she does not believe that he wants her he's not giving her any signs whatsoever that he wants her that he's interested in her physically and she knows this and he knows this so why are we playing this game why are we playing this game I don't get it so the conversation, um, okay, so in my opinion, when I saw this scene, when I watched this scene, I felt like this conversation was taking place after they attempted something and it didn't work out and now they're talking about it because I'm like where's this conversation coming from and earlier on in the day remember when the sun was still up he was making all these promises about how he was going to work harder on intimacy and now here we are and so I feel like they tried but then it didn't work out that's what I feel like and um Austin, you're not the first groom or husband on Married at First Sight who wasn't physically interested or attracted to their wife. You're not the first. OK, the only difference is the other husbands did not lead their wives on. That's exactly what you're doing. You're leading her on constantly every day. Well, I don't know how they edit it, but it seems like every single time there's a scene between the two of you, you're leading her on. You're making her think that you're going to make things happen. And then you don't just like when you had the, the, the candles, the fake candles all laid out in the room and you're playing that, you know, that sexy Q&A game. And then you, you kick the crew out and nothing happened. And it's like. Only you know what your body is capable of, Austin. Nobody else knows but you. So you know what your body is capable of. And if you know that you cannot deliver, stop making, stop starting things that you can't finish. So do whatever you got to do, honey. Say whatever you got to say, but stop feeding her lies. 
tell her what tell her, I'm a virgin and I don't know what to do. So I'm uncomfortable. Oh, I'm too much into my, uh, religion and I don't feel comfortable doing this because I really don't know you or let's get to know each other better. Or I have a six month rule. Say whatever you want to say, but stop leading her on. I mean, I wish you would tell her the truth. We all prefer that you tell her the truth. If you know what the truth is, preferably. And you know, you can tell her in a way, you know, it's going to hurt her feelings, but her crying all the time is worse than you telling her once and for all, let her cry it out and then let her make her decision after that. <sighs> Moving on, Brendan. No, so hold on. We're still on Austin and Becca. So the next day or whatever, they're packing up, leaving the retreat. And Austin asks if she wants to talk about what happened the night before. I didn't understand that. Does she want to talk about what they talked about? <laughs> or what does that mean? Or does something happen? And does she want to talk about that? Anyways, so um, Becca was like, um, do you want to talk about it? And so Austin says that, you know, the constant rehashing of this issue is what makes it so uh, challenging for him. But it seems like he's the one that's constantly bringing it up. Like he'll, he'll make these promises to her, doesn't deliver. And then she wants to talk about the fact that he didn't deliver. So her talking about the fact that you're not delivering is only contingent upon you making her promises that you're going to deliver something to her. So if you would stop making the promises that you're going to deliver and just leave it alone, she's not gonna have anything to talk about afterwards. So, um, he says that, you know, them constantly talking about their intimacy issue is like reopening a wound for him. So to make up for the fact that the retreat was a complete bust for them, he decides to take her on their way home. He takes her to like a, a wolf a shelter where they shelter wolves or something. And I think it was a way for them to forget about their problems to not talk about their intimacy issues, but it was anything but that because at the wolf retreat, after they have fun playing with the wolves, um, the person who worked there, um, talked about how they do this matchmaking process <laughs> for the wolves. And what they'll do is they'll take a male and a female wolf and they'll put them side by side, like in different areas, uh, but side by side. And if there's like an attraction, I guess, between the wolves, if there's like, if they show interest in one another, then they'll allow them to be in the same area to allow them to mate. And then she talks about how you can tell wolves are into each other, you know, because they're like, they'll start nuzzling each other or kissing each other, playing with one another, being really physical with one another. And I'm just like, wow, <laughs> what a thing. <laughs> For them to have to listen to when they're experiencing their own intimacy issues because the wolves are getting a lot more action than Austin and Becca. And Austin was clearly uncomfortable because when the lady was talking about how, you know, when they, when the wolves are, are when they get matched with one another and they like each other, they mate for life. You know, they choose that one mate and that's their mate for life. And Austin is like, wow, interesting. <laughs> It was a whole fiasco. So moving on from there, Brendan and Emily. Emily understands. Okay, so look, there was a scene as we were leaving the retreat where Emily was laying in the bed and she was like, oh, my hand, my hand hurts. And, you know, he's tending to her hand and everything and he's volunteering to pack up their stuff for them. And I'm like, Emily, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing, girl? We get it. We understand that you were very seriously injured. You went through a very tragic, tragic, tragic event. We get it, girl. But I feel like Emily is starting to pick up that the only way this man is going to show any kind of sensitivity to her, the only way that he's going to give her any kind of attention or any kind of physical touch is by her, you know, being on death's door. Other than that, you know, he ain't got time for her. Let's see how things are going to change when she is, um, more healed up. This was a pretty interesting episode. I did enjoy it. Thank you so much for joining me. I really do appreciate it on your way out. Please don't forget to rate the video. If you like this content, subscribe to my channel and I'll definitely talk to you later. Bye.